Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Cold Brew. My name is Rick Olivares, and tonight we've got a special guest in Joe Jackson bassist, Graham Maybe. And, uh, you know, this guy's an amazing musician, and I'm just so honored to be able to talk to Graham. Hi, Graham. Good evening. Good hey, evening. Rick. How are you? I'm fine, sir. How are you, sir? I'm good. Please don't call me sir. It makes me feel old. <laughs> okay, Graham. It's an honor to meet you. I'm so thrilled, man. Uh, I've been a fan oh, like for I've been a fan like forever. You know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Why well, you got a lot of albums there, man? That's that's. Um, uh... I was I was a little boy. Are you a, I was are you a DJ movie. or something? I, I do spin once in a while, but no, I'm I'm yeah. really a a music fan. I. I, I have my own independent record label here in the Philippines. And, um, Good for you. That's great. What's the name of the label? It's called Icon. Uh, the Greek, well, it's the Greek word, Akon, but I call it Icon, A-I-K-O-N. Right. So I just do a lot okay. of indie, indie bands and all that. And um, right, right, just right. to give them their chance. And uh, I, was in, so I was in sixth grade when, when uh, Look Sharp came out. And uh, I was already buying records as a young boy. And... Uh, that's how I became familiar with Joe Jackson and your your bass playing. And uh, like mm -hmm. I said, it was a massive influence in me. I took up the bass guitar because of that. And, um, Got and it. well, well, I do what I can, you know. <laughs> you're you're an amazing person, Graham. So, um, well, first and thank foremost, you very kind. I, I hope you had dinner already. You had dinner? Um, uh, I, no, I'm gonna have dinner after this. So, don't okay. Worry. Okay. Our, our yeah. schedule is all over the place. We got a lot going on here, so. so okay. Um, yeah, it's it's all good. All right. So uh, let's. You want to start the interview? Let's get going. And it's breakfast for you, right? I'm sorry, sir. It's yes. breakfast time for you. Yes, but I don't have breakfast. I usually have brunch. I'm trying to eat less because I put on weight during the lockdown. The because of. Oh the my god! Virus. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it yes. kind of screwed with everything, didn't it? Exactly. I lost did, my job did you be and. You know, oh, did you get it? Did 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 the did the pandemic hit you pretty hard in the Philippines or what? We had the worst lockdown in the entire world. I the lockdown was like two more than two years or thereabouts. Oh my God! Yeah, and we lost a lot of people. A lot, of, no, probably not as much as the United States though, but but we still lost a lot of people, and uh, we'll probably never know the true number. But imagine two years of lockdown. Two years. It was terrible. Oh my God. Yeah, and um, I was. Could you go out and get food and stuff like oh, that? Oh, definitely, we, definitely. We could do that. We could do that. And since I'm the the breadwinner of the family, I have to go out and be the one. And strangely and enough, I'm the guy who always goes out. I never contracted COVID. My two sons, because of delivery services, they contracted COVID, but not not the worst kind, thankfully. Right. Right. Oh and, my uh, goodness! Wow. Uh, well, I hope that you, 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 and your family did well during that difficult. Yeah, time. we did okay. We we knew some people that were worse affected, much worse. We did get it, but uh, I I got it so incredibly mildly that I don't think I would have even known I had it if I hadn't have tested for it. And right. the reason I tested is because my wife had it and she tested positive and she had a, a worse time of it than I did. So I I got really lucky. But you know, we did we did all the vaccines and and um, we we did the whole bit. So right, you know. right, right. Well, thank thank God that the worst is over. So we have a different well, set of challenges. Don't, don't don't say that. Don't say that. I, I, <laughs> there's I, another one. There's always another one coming. Apparently, that's what they keep I know, saying. I know. I know. Anyway, Graham, thanks for agreeing to this interview. It's yeah. I, I finally well, mustered the courage to to send you a message and if we could do this because. Um, you know, I've been following your work, and um, again, as a fan, this is a real treat. And I'm I'm writing an article about the 40, 40th year of Body and Soul, which is one of my favorite albums. And um, right, right. I just, you know, it's funny. I just listened to it. I haven't listened to it for ages, but I just sat and listened to it now to kind of get ready for this. And it uh, right, brought brought back a lot of memories and I the, like things I'd forgotten about. So, um, you know. It's aged well, don't you think? It's not my favorite Joe album, I have to tell yeah. you, but 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 really? I think it's got it's got some good stuff on it, definitely. Yeah. So so having said that, what's your favorite Joe Jackson album? Mm. 
Well, you know, I mean, there's there's a few, but but I think Look Sharp is pretty hard to be as a debut album. Mm -hmm. It's so full of great songs. It is, it is, it is. And I, I had such a strong feeling at the time, even before we made the album, we we had made demos of the album. Right, right. And uh, and that's what Joe took up to London to to try and get get a record deal, you know. And I when I, I when I sat and listened to those songs that we had demoed uh, all together. So we did them in three groups of four. So we did four songs and a few, few months later, we did four more. And a few months later, we did four more. So then we had 12 songs and listening to them all together, like an album, I remember thinking, wow, this is, this is really good. This is, mm -hmm. this, this deserves a wider audience. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe something's going to happen. And just to put that in perspective, Joe and I had been in a band before that that had a modest record deal and it all fell apart and it ended very depressingly. And we all thought, well, we had a shot and that was it. So the idea when we made those demos for Look Sharp, the idea that we could have a second shot seemed like a little far-fetched, but it, 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 look what happened. So, yeah. Well, so anyway, um, but I mean, I do think there's some good stuff on Body and Soul. It's not like I don't, Think, you know, I think Night and Day is a really good album. It is. That, it is. And, um, you know, there's a few albums along the way that I'm very fond of. I, I like, um, I think Blaze of Glory is a good album. I think Laughter and Lust is actually a very good album. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's one of my favorites. Um, and uh, um, yeah, you know, right. uh, I think I think Fool is a good album too, but maybe that's not right. many people know that one. <laughs> Right, right. You know, um, the shift to a jazzier sound uh, began, if I'm not mistaken, with Night and Day. And that was an awesome album. In fact, Stepping Out is the most covered Joe Jackson song. I think it's been covered by some 30 artists. And is that right? Yes, 30 artists. Wow, have, I didn't know that. Yes, and um, yes, recorded, actually recorded songs. Uh, and wow. uh, I think You Can't Get What You Want has been recorded by other artists around 10 times. That that's right. I'm not count, I'm not counting live performances, but these are actual recordings. Right. And uh, I a... I just recently heard I just recently uh, somebody told me about actually Dave Houghton, the mm. original drummer. Yeah. He told me about uh, uh, that Seal had done a version of Stepping Out. Yes, yes. Have he, you heard it? Yes, I have. I have. And, uh, I think it's really good. It's really good. I think it's really good. I I was shocked at how good it was because it's not an easy song to cover. I I think mm. not really, but. But uh, I think Seal does a really good job. Anyway, well, it's really Trevor Horn with Seal, I think. But mm. between the two of them, I think they did a great job. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm... No, that's all right. That's all right. You know, I, interestingly, at the time in the United Kingdom, there was I, I, some of my favorite bands, like Style Council, Everything But The Girl, China Crisis, Prefab oh, right. Sprout, Swing Out Sister. Yeah, I, loved, I used to love Prefab Sprout. Yeah, they were amazing, right? Yeah. They were beautiful. beautiful. Definitely. And, uh, you know, every time I listen to Steve McQueen and uh, I hear all sorts of stuff in the recording, Thomas Dolby was amazing on that album, the way yeah, he crafted yeah. that sound for them. But anyway, there was all these bands and more all of a sudden, even, you know, Curiosity Killed the Cat, they were infusing their music with a lot of jazz and all that. And of course, mm -hmm. Joe Jackson from I know that he was influenced by reggae. And um, by Beat Crazy, the, the band started changing the sound and all that. But what was it in Britain at the time? Why were all these bands putting in jazz in their music? I, that was absolutely amazing because this was the height of the New Wave era. Well, I think, you know, people got bored with just, you know, triads. You know, they were looking for more interesting chords. And, and, uh, and certainly, you know, it's interesting that, that some of the artists that came out of that punk new wave whatever it was um era are people like sting and mm. you know even elvis costello who their, their their musical palette is so much broader than what they were able to express early in their careers and joe is one of them i think you know he just had a lot more up his sleeve all along mm. and um, he just was waiting for the right moment to reveal his you know his true intentions or something something like that but right. um but but i mean think about the people that came out of that like i said like 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 sting and elvis and um 
um, and there's probably a few more that I'm forgetting right now, but I think, um, you know, even XTC, I think they got mm. much more adventurous in production and arrangement as they right. went along because, you know, you have to, you, you, you don't want to, if if you're if you're an artist, you don't want to just stay where you are. You want to be moving somewhere, mm -hmm. somewhere different. So. Right, right. But for for the Joe Jackson band, was it? Uh, how did you guys prepare yourselves for this 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 shift? Because, I mean, almost you could <clears> see <throat> the progression. The the progression was amazing, and uh, I I caught on pretty quick. I said, "Wow, these guys!" You know, I I thought that you know. When when Look Shark came out, you so you love Joe Jackson and the New Wave movement, and then all right, of a sudden right. things start changing. I said, "Wow, this is amazing!" And um, so you know that he wasn't the one trick pony. And then Beat Crazy, I think you're the only guy to sing lead vocals on a Joe Jackson album other than Joe. So you know. I know. Imagine my surprise when he said that. <laughs> yeah, I want you to sing this one. I'm like, really? So um, yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know, you you really need to ask him, but. Since you've only got me, I mean, you know, I I think he's he he's he was just trying to mix it up, and and uh, he certainly was listening to a lot of dub reggae, and um uh, and the other thing would be crazy is he, he that was his first album that he produced himself, so he he took a few more liberties and made some changes and did a few things, kind of on the fly, um, right right. Right. So it was it was a very different album. And as a matter of fact, it was not a very successful album relative to Look Sharp and I'm the Man. Be Crazy was a, not a flop, but it was it 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 uh, it did not do very it didn't do anywhere near as well. And it didn't have a hit single either. And um yeah, we were all scratching our heads thinking, oh, you know, maybe maybe we'll be going back to our day jobs, you know, next year. <laughs> really really I, I i thought that i think people at the time uh being a music nerd myself everyone was just looking for the synth music the fast and punkish post-punk new wave new wave stuff so like if duran duran people are just expecting them to sound the same as planet earth but you could see art is just growing as you said like spando ballet um the first album uh journeys uh, is just totally different from even the stuff that they were doing later with Drew. I think people took a while to adjust to that, that they weren't what they sounded like before. And I, I felt that way, that way about Joe Jackson. That, that's what that's where I, it came to my attention that there's more to this artist, this band that meets the eye. It's just, they're, they're doing no, something you're right. incredible. You're right. And he took a big risk, really, after um, after the original band to, to, to do Night and Day. I thought, even at the time, I thought... You know, his is his fan base going to get this? Are they ready for this? You know, I really didn't know. I mean, you you, you just don't know. And um, as it turned out, they were. But I mean, touring in the USA without a guitar player, you know, it, it was almost like outrageous. You know, people were <laughs> like, "Is it rock and roll?" You know, there was this debate going on, like, "What's happened to Joe Jackson?" You know. But uh, as it turned out, he had his biggest hits and. Um, in his biggest selling album night and day so but the, the what the other funny thing about that is that um he he uh he became less popular in britain as a result and and, and i can't even explain that one to you but um, more popular in the usa and less popular in britain from night and day onwards so but i think yeah. in the rest of the world people appreciated what he was doing and um certainly here in the philippines although i did live in the united states also as well yeah i do know here in the philippines he was massively popular and uh when oh, i wonder day, why we never i wonder why we never came there and did a gig i know i know if people <laughs> skip us but you're gonna love the audiences here and you guys are so popular over here and um you know the music was staple of the dance floor especially you can't get what you want you know so Right, right, right. You, you right. talked about being different and the bass being at the forefront of the band. And I thought of Peter Hook myself and listening to your music. And uh, and every time oh, I right. praise and every time I praise bass players, Peter's there. And then whenever he sees me post something about that, he says, "Hey, thank you for liking my music and the way I play." Yeah. I said, "Well, what band, what, what band was he in? Remind new me, order. Um, new order. New oh, order. new order. Right, 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 right. right. I'm so, also thinking of uh, what's his name. Um, 
uh, Jean-Jacques Brunel. Yeah. Brunel. Yeah. 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 He's another one where the bass was kind of up front in the, in the, in, in the scheme of things. Definitely. But, yeah. the, you know, those were interesting bass lines that you wrote for, uh, is she really going out with him? Beat crazy? Is yes, even beat crazy? Even you can't get well, me wrong. Yeah, just just a second there, Rick. <laughs> I didn't write those bass parts. Joe wrote the bass parts. I played the bass parts. He wrote. But them. but you he's the composer. He's the composer. But you made it come to life. Yes. Yes. And um, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. It was that was my job. Uh, and and uh, his vision was to have the bass be the propelling instrument, the 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 the, the, the lead instrument. Mm -hmm. And and not the guitar. He wanted to buck the buck the system, and and so the the guitar really was more of a rhythm instrument. And he wanted me up front, you know. And I remember having this discussion with him. You know, how do you feel about that? You know, like you'd be more the lead instrument, and I'm like, sounds great. Yeah, sure, bring it on. You know. So, um, but what I will say, what I will tell you about Joe is he has always come into any situation, any rehearsal, any recording situation with pretty fully formed uh, ideas, concepts, um, you know, like he, he knows what he wants and what he needs everybody to do. And he just has to convey that to them. And in the early days, it was much more um, labor intensive, you know, and like he'd have to somehow try and explain to the drummer, like what he wanted, like uh, one of the, one of and a good example of that would be Sunday Papers, you know, mm -hmm. where he 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 described to the drummer like, "If I want you to do this," and then the guitar player, "Okay, I want you to do this," and then to me, you know, "I want right, I want you to play a bass," and then he played it on the left hand on the piano, da -da 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 -da, you know, and then so then we all played our parts together, and and it was sort of like some magic happened, and we all looked at each other like, "Fuck, <laughs> that's amazing." <laughs> Well, it is amazing. It is amazing. Um, can you talk us about the bass line for stepping out? That's pretty challenging, huh? Oh, Rick, I got to burst your bubble again. I'm not on that. I'm not. That, that's a that's a sequenced bass line, a keyboard sequence. Mm. So I'm. I'm. It's that's not a bass guitar. Mm. Okay. So yeah, I'm. I'm oh, afraid wow. that I'm. I'm. I did. I, I mean. I mean. I'm. I am on the record. Um, but but uh, not uh, and I'm 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 not the lead the 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 bass that you hear when you hear the record is a sequenced keyboard. It's really? a mechanical. It's a, really? yes. It's a programmed. It's a programmed keyboard sequence. Okay, okay. Because when I, um, it's only in the in the age of the internet that I was trying to figure out how to play it. I I, I did. I did try to play it. Oh no! I I played it live. Believe me, I played it live for a fucking year. <laughs> and, and I would get I, my hand would cramp up because it's all octaves, so it's like you know. I know, you know, I know. Oh, right. Yeah, it, that, was, it was. You know, when I would watch on YouTube those bass tabs for for stepping out, I was like, "Wow, this is busy. <laughs> it's busy." And yeah, I said, it, 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 "It's unrelenting," is the word. It's it doesn't it stop. Is. Yeah, it, it does, and um, I can imagine your fingers would hurt. I said, "Wow, I, I think I got it wrong over here." Okay, that's amazing. So. Well, there it goes, and well, I'll just... tell you a funny story. I did, I played it on the night and day tour, you know, uh, every every show, and um, then the following tour was Body and Soul, and he mm -hmm. wanted to do Stepping Out. Obviously, he wanted to do it, and I said, "What about if if because I I wasn't looking forward to having to play that bass line again?" So I said to him, "Why don't you have the sequencer on stage, and it will sound more like the record." And, uh, you know, I won't get cramp in my hands. So he reluctantly agreed to it. And I will never forget early in the tour, um, he's standing at the front of the stage with his back to me singing the song and the sequence bass line is playing. So I'm not playing bass. And behind his back, he's, he's doing the thumbs up signal, which means speed up because he thought it was too slow. Well, of course, it, it's a sequenced... Now it's like playing to a, a track almost, mm, yeah. almost, yeah. not quite. But you can't speed it up. It's mm -hmm. it is what it is. And he forgot that, you see. He he felt that it was too slow, but so he's trying to get us to speed up. <laughs> we, we're all looking at each other like that's not gonna happen, you know. Anyway. That was amazing, huh? Okay. Um 
body and soul. You know, uh, again, Look Sharp is celebrating its 45th year this month. I and know, isn't that remarkable? I know, yeah. I, I feel yeah. old. <laughs> and what is well, actually, you know, we recorded it in in August of 1978, so it's actually 46 years in August, uh -huh. right? Since right. we since we recorded it, I know it didn't come out. It didn't come out until the beginning of 79. So. That's right. That's right. Um, so body you know, and soul. You're, body yeah, and you're, soul. Yeah, it was recorded at the Masonic Hall. Can you what, mm -hmm. what can you tell us? the moment you entered that because they use it for classical recordings and uh, you were doing a live setting weren't you yeah yeah the idea was to to use that the acoustics of that very austere uh, masonic temple to um to play live and 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 utilize the the the, the boomy uh, uh reverberant acoustics as much as possible and um yeah, it was different. It was very different. I mean, you know, when you're wearing headphones, it mitigates that somewhat because in the room, it was like this, you know, it was this huge sound in the room, especially Gary Burke on the drums. He was like, the you know, the god of thunder. Mm. And um, um, yeah, we the idea was that was the first time that Joe had wanted to track like that. Well, he he hadn't really had a a live horn section before so it, it was very new the other thing was that um we were recording recording digitally for mm. the first time and um so and they mic'd they mic'd the room to to really pick up the 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 um, you know the, the 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 acoustic reverberation of the room um and you can really hear it you know i mean i hear it now but the funny thing is you know like so many things i've worked on in terms of recording i i don't often sit down and and listen to these these records carefully once they're done you know once yeah. they're done you know you're, you're immersed in it you spend so much time on it and then you know it's not it's not like i come home and put the record on you know yeah. so i was at a i remember i was at a party a couple of years after body and soul came out and um the guy who whose whose house it was was talking to me and um he 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 had this incredibly lavish expensive stereo system with these speakers like i i never seen speakers like that before he had like like multi-thousand dollar mm -hmm. hi-fi mm -hmm. and he said to me have you ever heard body and soul on a really good hi-fi before and i said well no actually my my own hi-fi is really shitty and he, he said all right you're right and he's you know, he kind of dragged me over to the couch which was like and he sat me right in between the, these two like crazy looking space age speakers and he and he put body and soul on and turned it up loud and i it kind of blew my mind like it, it was like being back in the masonic Hall again and and i had a new appreciation for that album because it does sound pretty amazing when you when you crank it up a little bit you really kind of yeah yeah you get the idea definitely in fact uh i know a lot of audiophiles use the album as a sort of testing ground and i know that oh, it, really? yes yes it, they do because of the way it sounds and uh, I remember getting the record as soon as it came out because uh, when you can't get what you want at the American Top 40 and um, I said, okay, I can't wait for this record to come out. And I bought it in Hong Kong. I got it in Hong Kong and um, right, right off the bat, the moment the stylus hit the record, I said, it's, this is different. Not, mm. I mean, it's a step different from from night and day. It's a little more what? what the Different, different in terms of sound. There's Latin. There's yeah. like, there are a lot of things very, going on, but the sound, yeah. but the sound was just amazing. Up to that point, I usually reserve that feeling of amazement for jazz records, but this even sounded in many jazz records. And there was some. Mm. Uh, I think the attention to detail, the acoustics, the reverberation, how it was recorded, it, it just blew my mind away. And I can't tell mm. you how many times I read the liner notes over here. I must have. <laughs> Seriously, more than a thousand times. Yeah. And moving wow, to the U wow. yeah. moving to the U.S., I brought this record along with me, and I must have played it to death. So I have like four copies of this. Oh my goodness! Wow. Well, I, I well thank you so much. I I appreciate that. I I um I'm a big fan of liner notes myself. Actually, I I, I like to, and that's one thing I 
I enjoy, I'm, I'm glad that the vinyl album is not dead yet. And I do appreciate liner notes. You know, it's a lost art. Like mm -hmm. album cover art is, is, is also a lost art, but liner notes also, I think. I, I say bring back the liner notes. Definitely. And, yeah. you know, I, it, it, I have to be honest, as much as I was a fan of yours, it, it took this album for me to really look at everybody. I know that Dave wasn't there anymore. Gary wasn't there. They would come back right. later on. But I started looking at everyone, Vinny, Ed, Gary, Tony. Right. I think I started to pay more attention because here you could listen to all the instruments. You could hear everything. No one is trying to outshine each other. It just it, it was a really awesome, perfect recording. Yeah, I think that yeah. I think that David and um, Joe did an excellent job in bringing to life everyone. And I think of Thomas Dolby, the, what he did with Prefab, how every instrument shined, and uh, they wouldn't, you know, outshine each other, but they were there. You could hear everything. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, probably the most. It's definitely the most hi-fi Joe recording to that point for mm -hmm. sure. Definitely. You know, I I heard. Day. Yeah, I heard an interview of yours, and I think you guys were in a car back in the early days, and one of the songs on Look Sharp hit hit the charts in Britain, and you all, you guys all felt good. But okay, um, with with you can't get what you want when it hit the American top forty, and and it's still played to this day, believe it or not, it's still played. Um, I know, I I hear it sometimes when I'm in a store or something, it'll come on, you know, it, it, it tickles me. <laughs> Do you ever get? Do you ever resist the urge to tell people, "Hey, I played on that song"? <laughs> nah, I wouldn't do that. But but I, you know, I, I I it's enough to feel it inside that, like you know, feel all like you know, feel like I've done something that's lasted, geez, forty years. Holy cow! Right. That right. And people so. still play it, and it's being reissued. That people still buy it. It stood the test of time. It stands the test of time, and. Okay, just yeah. a few more questions. The verdict, it opens the album and this the thunders, as you said, the God of Thunder, Gary Burke, mm. incredible drums that they're how do you say this? It? It's controlled, it's but it's it, I don't know, it just sets the tone and then the brass comes in. Your thoughts about the verdict? Yeah. You know, I just listened I just, I told you I just listened to the album. I haven't heard that one in a very long time and I'd forgotten how you know as you say that's the opening song and the power of it just, the majesty the majesty just, of it it yeah it kind of hits you right in the chest right right from the get-go and um yeah i i it, it, it just everything it brought back a lot of a lot of memories you know i'd i i had only just been working with that lineup we'd only really been together for a few months so we we were all new to each other and i was learning a lot from those guys because they were all music students and I was like self-taught. So I was feeling a little insecure and, and uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. You know, those guys were like, they could play over jazz changes and I'm like this rock and roll hack that learned playing along to records in his bedroom, like everybody else I knew. So it was a very different experience, but they were great. And I really, I learned an incredible amount in a short time on that tour. And I really, really appreciate it. And I, yeah, the, the, I, everyone was phenomenally talented, especially Vinny. Vinny's absolutely unique and brilliant guitar player. And Tony Aiello, I gotta say, is one of the best horn players I have ever worked mm. with to this day. So, right. you know. but every, everybody was great. Everybody was great. And Gary is, is a lifelong friend. He's still a friend of mine now. And um, yeah, he's just got the he's got that fat back beat, you know that that yeah. What can I say about Gary? Cha Cha Loco, the second song, um, mm. Latin beat, and um, it gets you dancing. And uh, it's you know um, I remember even living in New York myself. Uh, I entered this. I, I went to this party and someone was playing Cha Cha Loco and I said, this is pretty cool. I, I said, you know, that's Joe Jackson. And then they were saying, yeah, we know it's Joe Jackson. I said, you guys listen to Joe Jackson? Yeah. And white dude who could play lots of music and even Latin music. We appreciate it. And these were Latinos and they're playing right, Cha Cha right, Loco. Right. You know, what are your memories of that song? Well, my well, obviously, my overarching memory is him uh, playing this this bass line that he wanted me to play, and I'm like, and there's 
there's a jump in it so it starts low down and then you jump up really high you know and i was like well that's tricky so uh but i liked it and um and i just remember i screwed it up once on stage because the lighting guy made a change right in the middle of me playing the line and my fretboard of my bass just went blank and i couldn't see what i was doing and and i I played completely wrong, and I looked over my uh, to my left, and the rest of the band were busting up laughing. So that's that's one of my memories of Cha Cha Loco. Um, but but no, I'm, I'm uh, the other thing about Cha Cha Loco is that I I didn't know anything about Latin rhythms before Night and Day. Mm -hmm. So just to go back a couple of years, and I remember Larry, the previous drummer, and I we. Um, he he had Joe had made demos for the first time for Night and Day, and there were some Latin rhythms on there. And I, and I remember saying to Joe, I said, I guess you've been listening to some different music there in New York because he had already spent some time in New York. And he said, Yeah, he said I really love the salsa music. He said I go and see it all the time, and it's and it was showing up in quite a few of these compositions. And um, so Larry and I said to Joe, you know, like. We, you, you got to help us out. We don't we don't really know like what we're supposed to be doing here. So I remember he sent us, and this was still cassette tapes. This mm, was still mm, the age yeah. of cassette tape. He sent us um, a, a, a double cassette tape, um, handwritten. He, he so he he copied it from an album, uh, and and it was called Understanding Latin Rhythms. So it was like a, you know, it was like a, a an educational recording. And you had people like uh, Tito Puente mm, and Tito Mongo Puente. Santa Maria, and they would, you know, they play, they play a montuno on the congas, and then they, then, 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 then they would talk, they would break it down. It's like, you know, and it was so interesting, and it really helped. I must say, it really helped because I felt like I was, you know, like in, in a, a, I don't know, in no man's land or something. I, I was like, well, I like this music, but I don't really understand it. And from a bass player's point of view, um, to not play the downbeat, you know, because a lot of a lot of Latin rhythms, you know, the bass player doesn't play, doesn't hit one. Mm. And that was that did my head in for a few days. I was listening and trying to get it and trying to get it. And then one day it just clicked and I was like, oh, OK, all right, that makes sense. And then it, then it started to feel great. And um, so Cha Cha Loco was, by then I was really comfortable and accustomed to playing those kind of things. So, but, um, but I thought that was just a fun song. I thought that was. It that is, was, it is. Yeah. And it, we would all sing, on the, we would all sing on the choruses and um, yeah. What can I say? That was, that was one of the fun songs. Do you feel that, you know, can... Yes, go ahead, please. Go ahead. No, carry on, carry on. I just I want to mention a, a dear friend of ours who mm. passed away recently, but but I'll 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 say, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, did all these changes in the music in the repertoire of the Joe Jackson Band help you become a better musician? Because after that, I started seeing you performing with other artists myself, and I thought I said, yeah, that's it, man. Uh, he's a really he's a really good musician. He can play lots of stuff, different stuff, and I think. People came away from body and soul with a better appreciation for all those artists, all those musicians on the album. But that's just me. Yeah. I, I wouldn't know. I, I don't know if you agree with that. No, I think, well, I, I, like you say, it's it's a very hi-fi recording. And I think it really does kind of showcase everybody. Um, when, uh, I, I appreciate you saying that about me. I mean, uh, I don't know if I became a better musician, but I'll tell you, I became a more confident musician I felt you know I, I didn't play with anybody but Joe for five years uh, or six years and then after Body and Soul um, uh, I started working with other other artists starting with Marshall Crenshaw mm, and then yeah. after that different people so I had the confidence that I could work with other people I had I had the ability to play different styles and fit into different situations which I didn't I didn't have that confidence before so i really have joe to thank because he had faith in me that i could i could uh rise to the occasion as a matter of fact before body and soul we did jump and jive mm, yeah uh, sorry before night and day we did jump and jive, and jive yeah which 
which really is just it, it's really all about um the walking baseline from, from 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 my perspective it's like fast walking baselines in four four which you know i mean i i i got it quickly but i had never really done anything like that before so again i i i thought wow can i pull this off you know um but in the end it turned out to be an incredibly fun experience the album and the tour so uh, yeah joe is joe's confidence and and faith in me has carried me a long way i have him to thank for that for sure and he could have easily found a latin bass player i mean god knows how many of them there are in new york city you know playing those little ampeg baby basses those guys tear it up but um, he 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 wanted he wanted me to do it so i did it <laughs> and you know one thing i will say listening to body and soul now and i know you love the album and everything but from just strictly from my perspective i feel like i could have done so much of a better job now mm. than i than i than i could do then so I, but that's because yeah, you're it, that's because you're a better musician today than you were back then but yeah yeah but also i think i i i almost there there's there's some times on the album to me where i feel like i sound a little tentative and i think it's just because i'm not as confident i wasn't as confident then as i am now you know because i was and as i was telling you i was working with these american guys that all music school grads mm -hmm. who you know who who could uh you know they conversed in a musical language that I was like, what the hell are these guys talking about? You know, and um, yeah, so it, I, I feel like I could definitely do a, a better job now. But, you know, that's. But you held your own, man. You held your own. I, I again, I've listened to this album. I wore out my first record. I really wore it out. Wow. As a young boy, I, I would play my records endlessly. And, you know, um, it's it's. Actually, it's in one of my favorite albums lists, so it's it's constantly on 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 my playlist. And um, no, I don't play them on CD. I play them on 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 vinyl. So yeah, I, good for I, you. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. So my I, wife and I love the vinyl. Yeah, we love our yeah. vinyl. Exactly right. So, but having said that, I think that uh, at times I would say I would listen, like for example, for Lois Saida, um, I, I try to listen to everything, all the instruments. I said, oh, everyone does their. And uh, sometimes you, I know you take a back seat to some of it, but no, I I thought that your 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 performance is still amazing. And I'm not saying that as a fanboy, but I'm saying that yeah. as someone who's listened to the album more than a thousand times, and literally more than wow. a thousand times. You you know the album. You probably know it better than I do, Rick. You probably do. You know all the warts and everything. But um, no, I, no, it, it's it's a great album, and you know I I have to say. I I appreciate one one of the things I do appreciate about Joe, and believe me, Joe drives me nuts sometimes too. So it's not like I love everything about him, believe me. But I do appreciate the fact that as an artist, he's done what he wants to do. In other words, he pleases himself first and hopes that the audience will come with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, he's doing a project this year that I'm not involved in. Uh, called Joe Jackson presents Max Champion. I don't know if you're aware of this. No, no. Yeah, it, it's well, it's 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 his version of British music hall music from the turn of the 20th century. Oh, wow. so it's very very different. There's no electric instruments, and it's um, you know if I can give you an example, uh, uh, um, you know the song Honey Pie by the Beatles. Yes. Honey yeah, pie. well, it's it's yeah. Honey pie is is sort of let that's Paul McCartney's version of music hall music. It's like vaudeville music, you mm -hmm. know. So Joe has just done that, and and the reason he's done it is because he loves that style of music and always has, and he just came up with the idea of doing his own version. So he did, and I think that's great. If you're an artist, you do what you want to do, and he's always done that. And I think even Body and Soul was a bit of a a risk. It was a risk. He could Definitely. have done more. He could have done more of night and day, you know. But he he did these long form, more instrument, long form, more more instrumental songs, um, with with jazz solos. You know, I mean, mm. he yeah, he was kind of fearless, and I I respect that. I do respect that.
you know, Graham, at around that same time, uh, Linda Ronstadt came out with her What's New album with the Nelson Riddle Orchestra. And oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, prior yeah. to that, she was doing more rock and roll stuff, and she hit the American Top 40 with uh, with a rock and roll song. And I remember her record label was saying, oh, this is the kiss of death. You're not going to do well because no one was doing those jazz standards outside Vegas. But it was a massive hit for her. She did a trilogy of these jazz standards albums. It was a game changer for her. But as right. much as I as much as I love that those albums, uh, because I was a young boy, so I was into new wave and all that. I think right. this, along with the Style Council, everything but the girl, got me to really go back to a lot of those music from the from a bygone age, and uh, that's why there's this healthy appreciation for body and soul more than night and day because um i mean you couldn't see the latin much of the latin rhythms on on night and, night and day yeah yeah and um but here i have to ask you this that's written and recorded in new york city these are the these are new york city albums and yes. so at the time i was like wow the, the, is it the city is it the vibe i didn't get that until i moved to the city myself and so having said, so two things, two quest, two part question, was the vibe? Did you feel it? Did you get the vibe of the city? And number two, was that why you moved to New Jersey and New York? Oh my goodness! Well, those the answers to those questions are very different. So, well, the first question is, um, those albums definitely pick up on the New York vibe, and um, so Night and Day was the first album I'd recorded outside of the UK. Mm -hmm. So I spent, you know, we spent several weeks rehearsing in New York City and and then recording. And, you know, Joe took me to um, to see some Latin bands. You know, he said, you've got to see this stuff to really appreciate it. And I just loved it. And I really got into it. And I I hadn't actually also just I simply hadn't spent a sustained amount of time in New York before. I'd spent a couple of days when we were playing there, but to actually be there for a couple of weeks. And I really started to appreciate New York and, you know, going to going to these places to see Latin music and hear Latin music. And, and um, yeah. I, 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 and we had... Um, a Latin percussion, an American Latin percussionist on night and day too. Actually, there were there was another guy that came in and played congas. So it yeah, it was much more of an American sounding record. And um, yeah, I hear that. And and so you're right there. Yeah, that 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 album would have sounded different if we'd have recorded it in London. You know, right, no right. question about that. Did it make you move? Um, Did it want to make you move to? No, I I I fell in love with somebody in Chicago and I moved. Yeah to Chicago and then and then after a couple of years we moved to New York because all of the work I was getting starting with Body and Soul was in New York so oh interesting so it was nothing to do with uh, it was nothing to do with artistic considerations it was really uh, it was uh, you know chercher la femme as they say oh okay okay just a few more before but I, I have to say this um there's this British band called Down to the Bone. They came out during the acid jazz era, and they put not out a, I'm yeah not they, they put out a couple of albums like uh, from Staten Island to Brooklyn or something like that, and Urban Grooves, and they totally got New York City. They got it. They got everything, the street feel. And I said, man, these Brits are amazing. They they got it, and you you just feel like you're driving down Brooklyn and all that. They said. Mm -hmm, so it's mm -hmm. an it's an amazing band down to the bone down it, to the bone okay yeah I'll that's the name. That. yeah they're 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 just they came up during the acid jazz years i think they're still active and again they're just amazing so okay just a few uh, you did want to say about someone who passed away so um uh there was a young lady called allison cornell who mm. toured with joe starting she did the uh, night music tour in 1995 she did the night and day two tour in 2001 and i think she did the duke tour yeah she did the duke tour in 2012 i didn't do that tour but... so allison toured with joe a few times 
and she just passed away. She was only 61. Um, she died of ovarian cancer and uh, wonderful person, wonderful musician. Uh, I, I, I miss her and um, really appreciated her musicality. One of my favorite tours I did with her was the Night and Day 2 tour mm -hmm. where she really got to shine uh, um, and sing lead on a couple of songs. But the reason I mentioned her is is that um, if you, on YouTube you can find her doing um, a version of Not Here, Not Now mm -hmm. from Body and Soul. Mm -hmm. That is just Alison playing the piano and singing that song and she does such a wonderful version of it. Her listening to her playing it made me really appreciate what a great song that is. And um, that's one of my favorite songs of Joe's, I must say. Not here, not now. I think that's a beautiful song. It is, it is. And uh, thank you for sharing that. And uh, well, I guess that's after after mentioning Not Here, Not Now, I guess uh, we can talk about You Can't Get What You Want. And again, it's still popular to this day. I hear it a lot, even on radio or, or, in, or in clubs and all that. Your thoughts about right. that song? Um... I think it's a it's a catchy title and and uh it's wow. it's a fun it's a fun song it does it get people up and yeah down. it's a fun song it's a fun song to play um as a matter of fact we've been playing it with the new the new band i should say the new band you know joe's band uh he's had the same quartet now for uh 10 years and um we, we yeah we can't we can't do a gig and not do that song and people still love that song and uh, um yeah you know joe always tries to rearrange things and keep it interesting for himself and for for us but um you know there are certain songs where the essence of the song is the bass line mm -hmm. and um um yeah i don't i don't really know what to say about it it's a great song it's it's a it's a fun song it's a song that makes you want to get up out of your chair and and definitely def definitely and um yeah okay uh on side two there were a couple of songs that uh happy ending be my number two i thought that be number two be my number two is yeah that's a great song too that's one that's another song that i think joe does at every concert yeah, that's people love to hear him do that. He often does that one solo. Mm. And the way the song ends, it's it, it it's its climax, and then oh right, with the on the body and soul album, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's got the huge, yeah, the the huge yeah. cacophonous ending. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, it yeah. it just really hits me, and then and then with heart of ice, the way it ends, it's a slower one, takes everyone down a notch or so. And mm -hmm. then it suddenly ends before you know it. Like, oh my God, the album's over. <laughs> I think "Heart of Ice" is one of my favorite songs on the album. I, I gotta say, I, I like, I, I, I like the fact that it's that there's no vocal from like mm -hmm. three minutes or something or yeah. four minutes, and yeah. then the vocal comes in near the end. And um, here's here's a little uh, "Heart of Ice" story for you. The only time that the, the, the uh, on the body and well the only time I've ever played Madison Square Garden in New York City was on the Body and Soul tour, and so it was it was a huge big deal for us to be playing there, and the first song of the set on the set list the first song was Heart of Ice. Wow, what an interesting so, way to start. Yeah, right. So um, so the stage is the stage is black, and then then there's a spotlight on. Gary Burke on the drums, just on the hi hat, and he's playing right. And then another spotlight comes on Tony, and he's standing with his flute, yeah. and he starts to play the the, the line. Right? right, the microphone's not working. Oh, At Madison Square Garden. Oh my god! And it's our first song, and all you, all the audience here is, is the hi hat. And, and they can't hear the flute because the microphone's not working. Joe, this is this is typical Joe. Joe takes a couple of steps forward. He says, "All right, stop. Let's get it sorted out, and we'll and we'll do it again." So everybody stops playing. All the lights go off. People are running across the stage, you know, unplugging things and fixing things. And uh, and the audience doesn't have a clue what 
what the fuck is going on? And uh, um, yeah, like a couple of minutes later, we do it all over again, you know, and, and then the, the, the hi-hat starts and then the light on Tony and the microphone's working. And But I just remember thinking, you know, here we are, you know, this is like one of the biggest gigs we've ever played and shit goes wrong. Just stupid shit goes wrong, and that's life, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the, so, and it didn't. It didn't ruin the gig at all. It was just. It was it, to me. It was funny, and it was like you know something. It triggered some kind of philosophical thought that you know you can you can think you're a big shot, and then you know you you solely your shoe comes off or something in the middle of a dance routine. You know. That that's interesting, and I, I do know that you were writing your book. Uh, are you done with it? Has it been out? Thank been you for asking. Thank you very much for asking. I am not done with it, but I am I am 30 something chapters in and I believe I probably I could wrap it up in a, maybe two or three more chapters. So I am tantalizingly close to finishing. And I, I think I owe it to myself and to my dear wife, who's been pushing me to finish the damn thing. I, I really got to do it. I, I am a world class procrastinator, Rick. I really am. So, you know, I can make this thing go on for a few more years, but I think I'm going to try and get it done this year. I think you should. Okay. Cause, um, and, I, and, as, and as long as you will buy a copy and read it, then, I know, then I, that, I, gives, that gives look, me motivation. Look, you know what? I intend to visit the United States sometime this year or next year. And if it's all right with you, I'd like you to sign my records and get a photo. It would mean a lot to me as you being one of my musical heroes. And sure. if the book is out, I'm going to buy it and all that. And I'm a journalist here in the Philippines, so I'm going to write about it as well. And I did tell my editor, hey, I'm writing about body and soul, and I'm, I'm interviewing Graham about it. So go ahead. Go ahead. Do it. Go do it. Because like I said, there are a lot of Joe Jackson fans over here. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, we don't get to do this too often. I mean, we wish the band came over, but th this no. is the closest thing to writing about it. And um, yeah. But yes, the book, please, please. Buy you know, it's... More often than not, we get books by Joe, people like Joe, people like um, Jimmy Page, the, you know, the top, the top dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we sure. get to hear from the band, and right. I think that would present an interesting perspective, right, and altogether right. different perspective. And I do, I do remember there was this film about the backup singers of the main, the lead singers. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, that 20 was Twenty Feet from Stardom. Twenty exactly. Feet from Stardom. Great movie. It I is. Love that it yeah. is, and um, so I feel it's this way. So that's why I'm excited for it. When I when I saw it on a podcast that you were writing one, I said, "Oh, where is it? I'm waiting for it." <laughs> Sorry for placing well, pressure. Yeah. Well, I, I I hope it's worth the wait. I really do, and I'm I'm trying to do a good job, and and I, I'm I'm pretty pleased with most of it. And um, some of it's hard to write because you know a lot of things that happen in life are not easy to write about, unfortunately. But that's you know that's just how it is. It's not it's you. not all funny. It's not all funny anecdotes about microphones not working. You know, it's not it's not yeah. all like that. Do, do you mind if I give a bit of unsolicited advice as a professional writer myself? Yes, please. You know, there's what we call the imperfect write. The imperfect write. Just write it. Even if you veer off course, even if it doesn't make sense, just write it, and then. When you're done getting everything out of your system, go back and look at it. You will see what works, what does not work. What you need to add or and re, and touch on, and what you need to remove. I think that's the that's the beauty of the imperfect right. You just you just don't stop. You just write, write, write. Even if you go off in another direction, even if it goes off into another chapter, that's okay. But when you're done, look at it. You'll see what makes sense. T take a nap. Go go to go to sleep and all that. When you look at it again. Oh, this works. Oh, this is corny. This oh, this is beautiful. Or like, why did I say this? That's the right. beauty. Give it a try, please. And I promise you it'll it'll seal your book. It'll it'll close the deal on your book. And uh, I've had someone tell me something along those lines before. And and I find that's it, it's a little hard to do it because I I I I've already gone back and edited what I've written like probably four times. Hmm. And I, I, I really believe every time I go back, it's better. Mm. And so I, in a way, I suppose I am doing that. And, and uh, I, w I will agree with you that, that, um, you know, you, you, you know, it's, it, what do they call it? The flow. I do, I do hit a stride where I, I feel like I'm in, 
I, I, I forget about everything and I just keep going. And, and I, I, you know, that, that's, 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 that's where you want to be. Mm. And, uh, I, but, but I'm not, I'm not a professional writer, you see. So. No, that, that's I'm, okay. That, that's the beauty about it because it's honest, right? Um, yes. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you for your advice. I, I, I will take it uh, and, and, and I'll give it a shot. Much appreciated. And whatever helps me finish the damn thing, basically. Okay. Last two questions. Um, yes, sir. What are you, la last word on body and soul? When you now you've gi you've given it a listen after all these years, what's the last word? What are your final thoughts about body and soul? And then I'll ask the final question. Last words about body and soul. Well. I think I'm proud of myself for, you know, I felt like I was hanging with the real musicians on that tour, on that album. You know, as I, as I said to you, you know, I, I was working with, 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 with guys that were of a higher caliber than, than the people I'd worked with before. And I felt like I had to raise my game. And, um, so that's one thing. I mean, I, I I told you I just listened to the album for the first time for a very long time, and I feel like I I, I thank you. And you said the same thing that yeah, that I held my own, and I feel like I did, mm. even though I felt like I was a little, I could have been a little more adventurous. I could have been. I was a little tentative here and there, but it's 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 uh, all right. So that's one thing. I think I did do a good job. And the other thing is, I think that I appreciate that Joe was trying to do something different and, and not just plod along doing the same old thing. And I, I think that's, you know, any, any artist should be proud of himself for that. You know, it could have, it could have been a flop, but it wasn't. Thank goodness. Um, can I tell you another funny thing about. Sure. Sure. Song? sure go ahead. It, please. It's, it's actually got my least favorite Joe song on it. Which one is it? It's the first song on side two, or is it the? Loisida, the instrumental. No, no, no. What's the last song on side one? Go for it. There yeah. you go. I'm not fond of that either. I'm not fond <laughs> of it. Like, what is this? No, it's, 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 it's yeah. Uh, Especially no, the way it ends. The way it ends. Go for it. Go for it. Go. Like, ah, uh, what's that? Yeah, I, I. You know, I yeah, that's every now and I mean, Joe hasn't written too many songs that I I really don't care for, but that's that's, yeah, I, that's what, you know, you know how sometimes you hit the you hit the the button to go to the next track, uh -huh. yeah, that's that's kind of how I feel about go for exactly. It. I, I thought what a waste you got Ellen Foley, you got Lee Castle, well, what a waste. I know, I know, <laughs> and they were great too. They were amazing. Yeah, but you know, as you said, there are those there are those tracks that that happen, and uh, thankfully it doesn't happen too often. But having said that, don't you think that Joe is such an underrated musician? Because when people talk about the the eighties, he's not on that first sentence. He's not, not even in the second. Mm -hmm. And I think I think it's criminal. I think it's criminal that he's not there. And um, well, that, that's just me. Maybe I'm I'm fanboying, but that's me. I I, I he did the stuff that he was doing. The music progression. Yeah. Who was doing that? I mean, you two later on, but Joe Joe was one of the first ones to do that. Yeah, and yeah. He he I, he did he did, he he made some bold moves in the eighties for sure. I think, and, and I think he didn't rest on his laurels and he didn't just stay. And the other thing he didn't do because he didn't have to is he didn't, uh, he, he, he didn't, he wasn't under pressure from a record, from a record label. Mm. He, he, he didn't have to listen to people saying, Oh no, you shouldn't do that. That's not going to work. You should do more of what you did the last time. He never had to do that because of good management. And, and he was never in financially in a position where he had to please people at the record label. So he was always in a position where he could kind of call the shots. And, um, and so he did. Right. And right. So. Yeah. Okay. Here's the, here's the last question. Aside from your book that I do hope that you finish soon, 
what else yes, are sir. you doing? What else are you doing now? What music can we look out for? What what's keeping you busy, sir? Not a lot is the short answer to that. I mm. I you know I'm 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 71 years old now. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm 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 not running around playing little gigs and schlepping gear. I I just not not to sound snobby, but I'm just I'm 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 done with that. I'd I'd rather stay mm. home and and scratch away and try and finish my book then then um but if a, if a decent gig comes along you know i do i do a few sessions here and there and um i did some fun gigs actually i had a little flurry of work at the end of last year i worked with my good friend joy askew mm -hmm. if you're familiar with joy, mm -hmm. joy not not very much not very much you should listen to her music she is amazing Okay. Joy, Joy Askew, A-S-K-E-W. -A she did the, the night and day tour, actually. She, she's not on the album, but she did the tour. And she's also on um, Blaze of Glory. She's on that okay. album, too. Right, right. She yeah, is yeah. phenomenal. And and um, um, actually, a love for her music is what brought my wife and I together. We both went to see Joy. So mm. I did some gigs with Joy at the end of last year, and I love playing, with, playing her music. And uh, I did a... Uh, yeah, I, I I I don't work that often, but um, of course I still love to play. Um, but I'm kind of lazy and and uh, I don't have to. You know, you were talking about being a breadwinner. You know, I was a breadwinner, Rick, for so long that I couldn't stop. I I wanted to fill my calendar in. I you know, and now I don't have to do that. My wife is retired. We're comfortable. So I'm kind of like I'm enjoying the chill time a little bit. Well, you you earned it, man. You you totally earned it, and that was a great body of work. And I I, I forgot to mention this because well, I I did say that after a while I saw you playing with Marshall Crenshaw, and he's another underrated musician, totally. Underrated. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish he got more props, more had more success because um, that was a time when just music was just exploding in all different directions, and I I thought that he should have gotten more than that. And I, I loved Marshall Crenshaw from the moment I heard his music. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, that's when great I... Great songwriter. Definitely. Great songwriter and a great guitar player too, by the way. Definitely. But but yeah. you also got to work with a lot. Um, I'm sorry, but how did that work with Bruce Springsteen? Like, the, you, <laughs> you, I need to ask I that did, since you lived in New Jersey. Yeah, I did I did a couple of gigs with Bruce because uh, they were, they were uh, fundraisers. But they were full gigs, but they were fundraisers for um, one was for the school that his children were going to in New Jersey. And the other one was a fundraiser for, I think it was Boston College or something like that, where another one of his children was, was going. And um, I, uh, that gig came about because I was working with a guitar player, a Jersey guitar player called Bobby Bandiera. Mm, Bobby, yeah. Who everybody everybody in, in Jersey knows Bobby. And mm. Bobby was putting a band together to back up Bruce for these benefit gigs. And he, he said, do you want to do it? And I'm like, do I want to do it? <laughs> Are you crazy? Yes, of course I do. So um, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. I've, I've actually been on stage with Bruce a few times. Um, That's amazing. How many people can say that? Right. I know. I, and, and Bon Jovi too. Did you know but, that? I've yes, done, bon Jovi. Yeah. yeah. I've done a bunch of gigs with John Bon Jovi, which, you know, he, he's another I, swell person with the, with the charities that he does. He's amazing. Yeah, no, he's, he's a, he's, he's got a heart of gold for sure. Um, yeah. I was doing gigs with him on and off since 2011 until the pandemic. And then, <clears throat> and then it all fell apart. So I don't know if that chapter is finished, but, uh, but then, yeah, I mean, you know, I was kind of a Jersey guy, so I got to know a lot of the. Definitely, yeah. I lived, I lived in Jersey City myself. I lived in Princeton for a while. You so... did? Oh, you did? Yeah, I loved. How I come? Loved... Well, um, I was moving around because that was a recession at the time, and I was just looking for a cheaper place. And um, I was staying with a with a family friend in Jersey City, and then after... it's hard to live with other people. I mean, unless it's your own pad and all that. So I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I stayed in Princeton. I stayed in Ewell. Where in, where in Princeton? Tell me where in Princeton. I know that and, area pretty well. Uh, there's a friend of mine who was, we were working at this deli inside Princeton itself. And um, we got really? this place. We were renting a room. And, um, but, you know, there's a, there's a sad story to that because um, it turns out that the, the guy who, was, who owned the, the deli wasn't, uh, 
he he wasn't paying us. He he stopped paying us our salaries after a while because he lost a lot of money at Atlantic City. And one of oh, my boy. one of my one of my uh, friends at the deli was so upset when he found out that he lost a fortune at, at the Atlantic City. He beat him up. And, oh my god! Wow. And then I I just stood just watching. I didn't bother to help or stop it because I was upset. Like, how do you go with for two months without getting paid, right? And then you have to pay your rent and all that stuff. So I was upset. So I didn't lift a finger to stop anything. Yeah. Well, and maybe then, the guy needed to, needed to learn the lesson, I suppose. Yeah, the, definitely. So That's a hard he, lesson. But... He, he was Filipino. He's Filipino American. Then he fired. Uh, he fired all of us. He didn't call the cops because you know, but for some reason but he did fire all of us and i remember going back to the to the house where i was staying i said like okay what am i going to do i don't have any money oh wow <laughs> so i moved around a bit moved around and but i love jersey because like the, the music scene there is amazing i got to see bands like taking back sunday thursday when they were just starting out and i i, I had a friend who was into that scene and i I didn't know about that scene until I that friend of mine brought me along and I said, what an amazing music scene. So there's more to Jersey than Bruce Springsteen. There's and, a lot um, of music in Jersey. There's, there's a lot, a lot of music in Jersey. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, Graham, thanks for your time. And I yeah, really Rick, appreciate it. You. I know you only gave me 30 minutes, but it's been more than that. And um, <laughs> I... I hope you don't mind. I'll bug you about the book, and uh, if I do get a chance to go back stateside, I know you're in you're in Long Island right now, are you? I'm in Long Island. If you come over, just you know, send me a message, and maybe we'll go get coffee, and I'll sign your record. Sure, sure, and uh, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, I got for definite, definitely. So let do you mind if I get a picture, even if it's virtual? Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I'm such an old fart now, but you know, no, go no. ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. Let me repeat that. I did it wrong. Here we go. Okay, hold on. Here we go. Graham, thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate you, and God bless you and your family. I hope that you're all well. More okay. you know, better health for you guys and all that. So, hope and no more also, pandemics. Yeah, definitely. No more lockdowns, okay? Definitely. Hope to see you soon. Good night. Okay, Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.